is uh, not something that we have done probably in the past couple years at least, having someone come in and talk, and we're very grateful to Steve Savali for coming in and doing this. Uh, Steve is a uh, graduate of MACA. He does motion design, art direction, freelancing, anything you name artistically, he can do. Um, so he's going to share with us some of the stuff that he does on a daily basis, uh, and basically what he did from going to college, being a student, to getting it into the industry. So uh, if you have no paper, definitely take notes. If you have questions, write questions down and ask them. Steve is a great guy, even not here online. He's very open to answering questions and helping people out because he's been right where you guys were. So thank you, Steve. Absolutely. So let's get right into this. 41% of people in this industry who have been pulled from student level to freelancer to working in a studio full time truly believe and have answered that technical knowledge is what limits them. That's what's holding them back from progressing more into this industry. Just by a show of hands, how many of you right now feel like you could accomplish anything in these programs that I ask you to? All right, so there's a few. And that's a good thing, all right? Most of you shouldn't have raised your hand because you're a student, you're learning. You're still supposed to learn, man. That's when it's fun. I'm here to tell you, though, one thing. Technical knowledge, I truly wholeheartedly believe, is not what's going to get you anywhere in this industry. All right. As uh, Sean has said, my name is Steve Savali. I'm a freelance animator, 2D artist, 3D artist in this industry. I also teach. I used to teach here. I teach for MoGraph Mentor. Um, I'm going to show you my demo reel. Just a quick cut down compilation of a lot of the work that I've been fortunate enough to create. And then we're going to kind of get into this. I'm going to get rid of some of the smoke in the mirrors that come along with this industry. Try to ease this process for you a little bit. All right, so that's a little bit about my work, the type of stuff that I create and that you can also be working on around here. A little bit about myself, and God, I hate talking about myself more than anything, so I'm gonna try to get through this quickly. I am from this school. It means so much to be back here standing in front of you, because I've been there. I remember sitting in your exact spot, well, kind of, not in this room. Um, but I remember being here and working so damn hard, being a bartender and a server, and begging people like Sean and Brian Sorio and Matt Bush just to teach me, because I felt like technically, if I could figure this stuff out, if I could know what these people in front of me knew and were talking about, then I'd make it, I'd be great. And come to find out, that's not really how it works. Technical knowledge will only give you a false sense of confidence, and I truly believe that, all right? How you are as a person, how you go about approaching things, how you choose your own adventure. That's the overlining theme for anything that I do, any class that I teach is. It's up to you to choose your own adventure, all right? That's why I said I'm so mind blowing that technical experience is what people feel like limits them. Because technical is not gonna separate you from anybody else, okay? Knowing how to press a few buttons, use a plugin, use a cool little script, it's not gonna help you anymore. Yeah, it might make that process easier, but it doesn't add any value to you. Who here wants to be an animator? Just raise your hand. I love it. Who wants to be a designer? Even better. All right. <coughs> Web people, do I have any of you? Who wants to get into a few? What about anybody with video games? Photography? Who wants to do art direction? We even have some art directors. Those are going to be the people who tell you what to do, and it's fun. <laughs> All right. So that's a little bit about me. The challenges that you face, though, in wanting to do this stuff, all right, if you're anything like me, it's, hey, 
I'm going to trade hours and dollars, and that's going to get me there. That's what's going to help me bridge that gap. It's so much more than that, and that's why I wanted to take time out to come here and talk to all of you. Because if you can understand how to approach certain things in a different way that isn't technically sound, you can really progress. You can get yourself that much further ahead than everybody else. Because you're not just competing against the people in this room. All right? You're competing against everybody. You're competing against me. You're competing against everybody around you, people at CCS. You're going to be fine. They're not that good. Um, <laughs> I went to CCS for a month. That's fun. Um, but the point is, this industry is constantly growing. It's up to you to decide, hey, are you going to put in what it takes to actually get there? Are you going to be self-motivated? Because to be blunt, I truly wholeheartedly believe motivation is bullshit. All right? It's only going to carry you so far. You read a cool quote, yeah, you feel really good. You listen to me talk, holy, yeah, Steve said some stuff. I feel good. I'm going to go design some stuff. But what happens when it gets tough? These are the challenges that you face. How do you get past that? How do you keep moving forward? All right? The first thing I want to talk about as we start to get into this is a little bit more of your basic structure. All right? I'm not going to teach you what are your quick keys. I'm not going to teach you what colors work well together. All right? But I'm going to give you ideas and concepts to look at things a little bit differently to help you make those decisions. All right? First off, we're going to talk design. Who here is comfortable with design? Wonderful. Opposite side of that. Who here is not comfortable with design? It's okay to not be comfortable with design, all right? I want to talk about a couple basic principles, though, a checklist, almost, that you should almost have as you go through doing this stuff. So the first being contrast, all right? Contrast is key to everything. I have it written up here. A difference of some kind. Contrast doesn't just mean going layer, contrast, crushing it, Instagram filter, contrast, better. Contrast just means different, okay? So on the left here, what are you seeing? What's the difference in these two? Anybody speak up, feel free. Size, size. Exactly. Size can convey everything in scale. And to give you an example of that, I worked on a project with ESPN. It was cool, it was for college football, and I created this huge, crazy, crashing together thing. And it looked good, but there was no sense of scale. Learning this one trick changed my design approach forever. I put people, microscopic in this, just enough to where you could see it. All of a sudden, this huge crashing together fortress that I had built wasn't just small. It wasn't just without a sense of scale. It felt enormous because you had something to give it a relation to. So how many people have seen pictures of blue whales in the water? It's amazing. It's beautiful. All right? Or you see planets. Awesome. But you have nothing to relate it to. So that's why you can't really grasp the sense of it. Now, if you saw a picture of a blue whale with a diver, well, that changes everything. When it comes to your design, think about how you're utilizing scale, because that's going to go a long ways for you. The other thing, contrast and color. If it's all the same, it's boring. You're not defining anything. That's why you don't see many advertisements with flat black or shiny black. Yeah, it may look really good on print, but only for a very select few. All right? Contrast and color is going to really help your designs pop. And being very purposeful with where you put that change in color. Can anybody else give me an idea of how contrast can work in your design? Shape. Shape, that's a great one. Saturation. Wonderful, I love it. Saturation's a huge one with color. Texture. Texture's great. Oh, texture's so popular too. How many of you guys love texture with design? How many of you know how to do it besides getting an image off the internet, putting it in there, and going file overlay? Kind of. <laughs> All right, that's the OG way of doing it. That will ruin you, OK? Don't do it that way. Textured brushes. They're in Photoshop now, 2018, Kyle Webster. Also, Kyle Webster made a whole bunch of brushes way back before he was in getting paid by Adobe. And they're great. They're awesome because they're fun. They let you paint. Why does that hold value? Why is it valuable for you to be able to paint over your drawings or your illustrations? Can anybody tell me? What was that? Exactly. You're not automating stuff. All right? If you had an expression, if you just hit a button, if you had a plug-in, it looks the exact same as if I do it. There's no value to that. Your job is to get hired. You want to do this for a living. 
So take that time. Enjoy that part of it. Texture's a great one. Alignment. This is a huge pet peeve of mine. All right? I learned this at back in Macomb. So when I got into the industry, this was already cemented into my head. Now, if you look at the left, um, sorry, colors are a little off. You can't see the red as well. If you look at the left, everything's just kind of placed. You get a variety in size. You get different contrast. So yeah, it's a little appealing. But there's still things that are broken. All right? It is my job as an animator to put together pitch decks for companies. What that is, is it has mood boards, style frames, storyboards, saying, hey, this is how I'm going to bring your idea to life. I've done it for Disney. I've done it for HGTV. I'm doing it with Google right now. Do you think Google will take me seriously if I can't even show them a presentation that's nicely aligned? It's not going to happen. They're spending a lot of money on you to create this stuff. And they're trusting you that you're going to take it seriously. When it comes to putting together a PDF to showcase your work, take the extra time to make sure things are lined up. If you look at the image on the right, everything's lined up. It's the exact same shapes for the most part. I think I actually changed one of them. All right. But they're all lined up. They've got the same spacing in between. It's more appealing to look at. You don't have to go rogue as a designer and say, I need to make this beautiful collage. It's not going to work. It's only going to hurt you. Keep it simple. We're going to talk about that in a second. Proximity, which is one of my favorite things. All right, proximity says everything. I have it in white, so I'm giving you the answer. It conveys relationships. But if you look at the circle on the left and the right, kind of oval because it's green, um, somebody tell me what type of feeling, what type of emotion do you get off of that? Like closeness with the person. Close, yes. So maybe they get along. Maybe these two circles are friends. Maybe it's a child parent. What was that? Parent child. Absolutely. Now, if you look to the other side, you've got a huge gap, huge distance in the space. What would that tell you? Relationship is strange. Strange? I love the word strange because strange That's is a fun one to grab on to the anime. Strange, but strange oh, strange is also good. <laughs> As things get further away, there's not that sense of unity or togetherness. And you can use that, all right, with contrast. You can use that to really convey a sense of emotion in your designs. Just little things. These aren't things the computer's automatically going to do for you. All right? These are just a small little checklist of you to go through and say, hey, am I doing this? Is this happening? OK? Now, I didn't make a slide for this, but I do want to talk about this. One thing that I do for all of my students that put together designs is I draw a box. Who, raise your hand. Who knows what the bounty box in Photoshop is? Everybody should if you've opened Photoshop. It's that box that you have to hit under. It breaks everything. Um, I'll draw a bounding box like that around their main things. So in this, I would draw one all around the green circle. I'd draw one around the white circle. And I'd look at just those boxes, like a wireframe. Think about that for you web people who are going to get into doing wireframes before you actually get into building the content on the site. And I'll look at just that. How does that relationship look? Are you getting differences in size? Are you seeing that spacing or that togetherness? If you strip away what you're looking at, the main core of everything, you can tell whether you got good design working in your favor or not. Moving on. This is one that I cannot stress enough. If you take anything from me today, actually, this should probably be like number 17 on the order of importance, but <laughs> it's a big one. I can only begin to tell you how many times, and I was guilty of this too, so please know that I was in the exact same place making these exact same mistakes. All right? where I get people who put together landscapes for their design, or a street view, or anything with a sky. And everything in front of it doesn't interact with that sky. You get a nice gradient that almost feels too cartoony. You have all these objects in front of it that are fighting each other with styles. Has anybody been in this? Has anybody looked at their work and been like, something just doesn't look right? That should be everybody. If it's not, you guys are, you'll be fine. Um, you don't need to hear listening to me. What I mean by unity is, on the left-hand side, you can see that I have multiple different styles. I have gradients. I have a stroke around stuff. I have things with crisp edges, things with round edges. Nothing that really gels together works. But on the right-hand side, I took those exact same images. And I used the texture. I painted all that texture on it using those brushes I was telling you about. Like Wash a go-go. And another one. Hit me up. I'll tell you what they are. They're fun. 
and everything fits together and it just looks good. It looks appealing. There's actually a soft gradient that you can't see um, because of the screen. But really take that time to say, hey, does this lighting make sense? Take that time to listen to your illustrator or your teachers who teach illustration, who teach you about shadow and lighting. If you understand shadow and lighting, you're really going to be able to push your designs so much further than everybody else. All right. Right now, it's really easy to say, Steve, you said 41% of people technical. I think you're full of because I really think technically, if I knew how to do this stuff, I'd be fine. If you know what needs to be done, you can learn how to do it. All right. It's one thing knowing how, it's another knowing that it needs to be done. A lot of people know how to do this stuff as they progress in this industry, but they ignore it. All right? And their design suffers, and then their career suffers, and then they blame it on things like my technical knowledge, my experience, uh, you know, I just don't get the clients that I want to. Well, are you putting yourself in a position to grow, or are you just kind of hoping that somebody's going to carry it along for you? So these are just a few checklist items on design. I'm going to move forward with getting into um, actually fonts first, and then I'm going to move forward. Fonts are, who has trouble picking out fonts? There we go, a lot more people with this. I'm going to make it real simple for you. This is, this is the secret to fonts. Stop trying to be decorative. Stop trying to do all fancy fonts or scrolling through a whole book. If you need differences in weight, Stick with one font family. I'll say Helvetica. We could go Gotham, Futura, uh, Google Sans has an awesome one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> um, stick with one family of fonts per brand. And then change the weight. To tell you what I mean by changing the weight, look at the right. The right is all the same font family. It's just different weights. And by weights, thicknesses, so from thin to thick, all right? Alter your kerning, your space in between your letters, all right? Who knows what kerning is? Raise your hand. Great. If you don't do it, I will never hire you. And I'm saying that I probably have kerning issues in this because I was working fast. <laughs> kerning is so important. Please, please take the time to kern. Who knows the quick key for kerning? I said I wasn't going to tell you any quick keys, but I'm going to. Oh yeah, that's right, I did hear the brackets. You can also hold all or option in your right and left arrow in between two letters, and that'll automatically do it for you. There's no excuse, you don't have to highlight and scroll and do all that kind of stuff, that's dumb. So, fonts, most importantly, one font family, change the weights. How do you decide what font per product? I'm working on a truck commercial, an F-150. Do I want a thin font? Why? You're right. Absolutely. Now you're able to start making these decisions. Do I want the kerning really spaced out? No. Spaced out kerning, airing, makes something feel softer. Smashing those letters together, leaving a little bit of breathing room, makes it feel strong, makes it feel tough, together. So you're able to start making these decisions before you've even gotten to designing stuff. So know your product, know your brand. Because that's going to make your life so much easier. There should be never any concern with picking out fonts at this point. Keep it simple. Don't try to get decorative with it. I'm going to move forward to what I love, animation. All right, and before I do, does anybody have any questions on the design aspect of things? Yes. Yes. Great. KISS is keep it simple stupid. All right, I didn't make that up. Uh, most of you probably already know it's a good question. I forgot to touch base on it. I truly mean that. Keep it simple. Yes? When you were talking about unity, does that include continuity as well? I love seeing continuity in anything. It's so important because if it's missed, it almost feels like you're not considering things from shot to shot or from brand to brand. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes, absolutely. It's important. Actually, my girlfriend will watch TV with me, and she's a dental hygienist, which is hilarious, and she'll call out continuity errors more than I will. <laughs> so that's a true thing. Um, all right, if you have more design questions, we'll touch base on it, but I want to keep moving on. Those were good, good questions. Animation is everything. I love animation. All right, who's my animators here? We're best friends. Whether you want to be or not, we are best friends now. All right, animation is so great for this one main reason. You're bringing something to life. All right, and if you do it well, if you do it right, people are going to feel something. My demo reel, I took a complete 
shot out into the left field. All right. I don't know, how many people are used to seeing demo reels? They're important to have, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But usually people go with uppity music. Something makes you feel, yeah, movie trailer, and I did. Oh man, back in my, my heyday of this stuff, that's when, what was it? It wasn't techno, what's the, I don't know. Dubstep. Yeah, dubstep, that's it. That was everybody's demo reel. Oh, that was, that was weird. Um, but it made sense. I went completely left field. Because if you blend in, if you're always doing everything to imitate, you're never separating yourself. So I'd rather take a chance. Maybe it goes well, maybe it doesn't. I trust in the content, and maybe this music will carry it. And the music actually worked in my favor. I think people love my demo reel more for the music than actually for the work, and that's cool with me, as long as they're reacting. But the whole point of animation is you get people to feel something. And that's amazing. You can't do that with anything else. So the first thing, same thing with design we're going to talk about when it comes to animation is assigning personality. When you get into After Effects, in the Cinema 4D, um, I'm not talking about Maya at all. Um, <laughs> No, I feel good about what I just said. Me and Maya had a horrible breakup, and it was Maya, it was not me. All right. No, sidebar, I got back into Maya about a year ago because I had to for a project. Maya crashed a Photoshop file. I don't even know how that's possible, and Maya did. It was a table. So I'm going to stick with Cinema 4D, but that's just me. Now, personality is everything when it comes to designing. When you get into these programs, it's real easy to start setting keyframes. Keyframes don't make you an animator. Keyframes only state... I want you here at this point in time. I want you here at this point in time. Animation, and I might be jumping the gun a little bit, is how do you move things from there, all right? If I have this ball on the left, the square in this little circle, just chilling on the left, what type of personality are you seeing in any of that? Bland. There we go, boring. Is it, is it appealing to look at? Maybe. You got the contrast, you got a little bit of texture, unity, but nothing's happening. On the right-hand side, what's happening? Exactly, there's personality, there's something happening, all right? It's up to you as an animator, it's up to you as a designer to start to convey this sense of personality. There's nothing I love more animating than getting something and bringing it to life. If I give you a circle and I tell you to animate it, what's the first thing you're going to do? All right, great, I love it because it's fun to do, all right? Not dynamics, we're adults, we use keyframes. Okay, so let's make it bounce. So how do you start making it bounce? Kind of warp it. Warp it. Up and down, warp it. Great. These are the answers I was hoping for because you're thinking technically how you would make it bounce. Great. You'd animate in the Y position. You'd separate your dimensions in After Effects because that makes life easier. All right, maybe you use a speed graph and you don't separate it. But what you didn't do is you didn't give a personality before you started setting those keyframes. Is this ball heavy? Is it... Like, did this ball just drink way too much coffee and is going crazy everywhere? All right? It's up to you to decide that. Is it tired? Is it sluggish? Is it slow? Well, if you know that before you've even set one keyframe, you know how to tackle something. You know exactly what to do rather than trying to fight the program. You all are at the point right now, all right? And I know this because I was there, and it sucks. It sucks so bad. Where you're fighting the program more than you're fighting your creativity. Because you're just trying to get a good grasp of what you're doing. All right? Remember, though, your whole purpose is to bring personality to stuff, bring life to stuff. That's the fun of animation. So when you start to do that, when you start to assign, hey, this is the personality that I'm going to give these things, before even setting keyframes, you've given yourself a roadmap. And if you've done the design things that we've talked about and check those off the list, good to go. That is just keep finessing, keep going at it. Moving on, 12 basic principles of animation. Please, if you have something to write down, write this down. 12 basic principles of animation. I'm not going to go through them all right now for two reasons. One, I don't want to. Two, I couldn't. I couldn't name them all. all right, I'd get most of them, but I'd fall short. The 12 basic principles of animation were, came up in the 80s all right, with Disney. And it says, hey, if you have these rules, if you apply this to your animation, you're going to see some great things come from it. You're going to see life. You're going to see your arcs. You're overlapping. You're stretching. you squash and stretch. Anticipation. Anticipation is a big one. If you're an animator, when you get into animating a ball bounce, for example, the first thing you want to do is you want to build up that momentum. So if it's going to jump, 
this way. You want it to lean the opposite way first and then launch. Build that anticipation. It's going to make for a more appealing look. What I have up here, I cannot stress enough. Spacing and timing and the understanding of it means you can get a job. If you don't understand it, you're not getting hired. It's as simple as that. Back when I first got into this industry, I, don't, I didn't even know. I knew the graph editor existed because I remember being overwhelmed by it. And I never used it. All right, my demo reel, my first one that Brian probably showed the last time he showed the demo reel, and it's awful. Um, everything's linear mov movements. Super boring. Super unappealing to look at. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. As soon as I got into this industry, though, it was, hey, we, you need to learn the graph editor. How many of you are comfortable with the graph editor? All right, how many of you are uncomfortable with the graph editor? It's OK, too. I want you to work on that before you go home or when you go home today. Next couple of days, I want you to really focus in on that. Because if you want to get hired in this industry, if I don't see the understanding of timing and spacing, we're not going to bring you on. All right? And what I mean by timing and spacing, timing is I set a keyframe here, and I set a keyframe here, and it takes this much time for me to move over there. Spacing, though, is how I get to there. All right? That's what makes good animation. All right? So if you look, you kind of see the blue line. Each tick mark. This is a chart. If you're into cell animation, you know a little bit about this. If you're not, don't worry about it. That's a whole nother world. But what it says is, from point A to point B, on left and right, I have that many frames to go. So if I'm animating, and it's 24 frames per second, I don't know how many tick marks I have, but it's going to take me that long to move from A to B. Well, I don't want to move evenly spaced the whole way. That's a linear movement. That's boring. We don't want boring. All right, we need contrast. We need movement. We need life. That's where you get in the graph editor. I'm going to jump into that right now. Here's a quick little dirty chart of the graph editor and what these lines look like. This is essentially, except for the bottom right one, looking at two keyframes. The one in the very top left. Who can tell me what type of movement that is just by looking at a line? Great. I love it. Linear, super boring. Okay? Except the only time I use linear animations is camera moves. I mean, I'm sure there's some gray area, but for the most part, Camera moves, it will work if you have a bunch of camera moves and you're cutting and you don't see that start and stop. Because sometimes you don't want to ease in, ease out, and then we ease in, we ease out, we ease in, we ease out. It gets repetitive, all right? And if you want to challenge me on this, I will tell you, look at one of my favorite television show intros, Game of Thrones. It's awesome. Who knows Game of Thrones intro? Yeah, yeah, got the song going. You're welcome. The Game of Thrones intro has the exact same camera move per area of the map you go to. It's exactly the same. That way they can piece more in. They can make it modular. Everything starts and stops. Now that I've told you that, I've ruined Game of Thrones intro for you. You will no longer like it because you're going to see it and be like, son of a bitch, he was right. All right? The only time I'll do linear movements is if I'm cutting cameras because it keeps that motion continuous from shot to shot. Speaking to your continuity comment earlier. Sometimes continuity is just in movement. I love cuts with animation. All right? It's more of a, I don't want to say advanced, but it's more freeing every now and then to have a cut rather than things morphing. Who loves animating morphing? Things changing into each other. We're just going to say a few of you do because nobody raised their hand. I'm going to pretend that you do. All right? So here's the best part about that. Looks great. Then the client sees it, and the client's like, hey, great, we want to change a couple things. And you're like, oh, man, everything's broken. So cuts can actually help you on timelines as well, rather than crazy morphing. Next one, top right. What type of movement is that? What was that? Ease in. Yes, now we're seeing a little ease in, ease out. And what that says is, as we leave a spot, we speed up and we slow down. We de-accelerate as we hit that rest point. That's natural. What do we got on the bottom left? Exponential? Maybe. All right. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> but what it's saying is, if I agreed and I was wrong, I'd probably yeah, sell it, but then you guys would be like, I think, maybe. Um, it means I'm going to speed out of something. I'm going to highly accelerate out and ease in. That can be really fun sometimes. On the very bottom left, who can tell me what type of animation that would be? Bouncing. Absolutely, it's bouncing. It means that when we hit the ground, we leave the ground with the same force. I say that again. When we hit the ground, we leave the ground with the same force. I'm going to say one more time. When we hit the ground, we leave the ground the same force. 
when you get into animation, I can only begin to tell you how many times I see ball bounces easing into the ground, or things coming down and they ease into the ground. I love it. I, I thank you so much for using the graph editor. I love you for it. But maybe that's not the way to use the graph editor in this case. Because if we eased into the ground, you could go jump off the building and you'd be just fine. We don't ease when we go down. When something hits the ground, it hits, and then well, it either splats or it'll bounce back out. As an animator, as a designer even, it's up to you to understand how movement like that works. Because your viewer knows that's how things like that work. And they don't want to hear, oh, I'm still new, I'm still learning. OK, why don't you do it right? You know if it's wrong. You know when you look at it, it's wrong. Just keep working it. Because most of the time, you're probably 80% there. It's just getting it a little bit further. All right, we're going to move on. I came up with originally a top 10. Then I started writing them all down, and I had like a top 15. And then I started to put this presentation, well, actually, I had like a top 27. And then I condensed it down, and I started putting this together, and I counted at the end, and then I had 17 points that I wanted to make. So I'm like, we're talking about 17 things. And these are going to be, we're going to kind of go through this quickly. All right. We've talked a little bit about animation and design. And if you have questions on that, I'm going to open the floor to those questions after we're done here. All right, because I'd love to hear them. I love answering questions. What I said in the beginning, I truly, truly mean. Technical skills will give you a false sense of confidence in this industry. All right? It will. Yeah, you feel comfortable. But once you get sitting down and you're working on a project, that goes out the window. Because it's not about technically what you bring to the table. It's about what your mind brings to the table. It's about what you come up with, the value that you bring to something, not the value that a computer brings to something. And if you understand how to utilize this, you will push yourself further than any of your talents ever will. And this will become one of your talents. I truly wholeheartedly believe I got into this industry because my ability to bullshit. I was a bartender and a server. People loved listening to me talk for some reason, and I never had a shortage to say. Apparently now I still don't have a shortage of things to say. All right, But that ability to talk and to relate with people, I believe, took me further than anything else. And everything else will catch up. But let's get into this. Who here has heard of The Gap by Ira Glass? Ira Glass. One hand. Great. I'm going to give you a quick rundown version of it. The Gap says, hey, we all got into this because we love this stuff. We love creating. All right? We love art. We love everything that comes with it. So we have great taste. Right, we know what looks good, and we love it, and it's right there. And then we sit down, and we're like, cool, I'm going to create this stuff. And you start doing stuff. Yeah, I work on a tablet and stuff. And all of a sudden, it, it doesn't look like that. Like, what the? It just happened. <laughs> like, I felt so good. I knew exactly what I had to do. Steve even told me a couple things. It's just not working. That's the gap. What that says is, hey, I'm creating work that's here, but my taste is so far beyond that. Why? How do I bridge that gap? I'm here to tell you that I've been in this industry nine years. Nine years, yeah. And I've been doing it for even longer. You never bridge that gap. That gap never goes away. You will always look at other people's work. You're like, that, that is amazing. If, I, if only I was doing that. I'm working with some of my favorite studios I could have ever dreamed working with. All right? It is more stressful working with them than working on nothing. All right? Because you're like, oh, I've got I to gotta bridge that gap. That gap, though, not going away is one of the best things you all could ever hope for. Because that gap being there will always drive you to want to know more. It will always drive you to want to be better at what you do. Okay? If that gap's not there anymore, that's when you need to be concerned. That's when you need to look at yourself and be like, maybe. Maybe I'm burnt out. Maybe I need a new, fresh start. Maybe you're the type of person that's really comfortable, though, with that. You're like, hey, you know what? I'm comfortable with what I'm making. I'm making a decent living. This is good. That's awesome. I'm not here to take that away from you. That's great for you. I personally have a personality where I'm never happy. I'm never, it's never enough. I get there and I'm like, cool, I got here. Anybody else can get here. Let's work hard. It's always, so the gap never goes anywhere. Accept that though. It's a good thing. Okay? It's frustrating. It's paralyzing at first. All right? It can stop you from creating work. But if you embrace it, it'll go a lot longer. And that leads me into the wall. If you've ever taken a class with me, especially my students nowadays, one of the things I will always talk about is the wall. That wall sucks. And what the wall is, is, hey, you get started on a project. You feel good. I got a good concept. I got a good idea. And stop me as soon as you know this. Raise your hand. 
You start working, all of a sudden, huh, that good idea is gone. Oh, I had this idea and now I'm not able to technically figure it out. Uh oh. Like, it happens. You hit that point where you're like, huh, this sucks. Maybe I should go in another direction. And what most people will do, and I truly mean most, because if most people didn't do this, this industry would be flooded. Okay? Most people will stop. They'll turn around and say, that was a bad idea. I'm going to go with idea number two. I pitched two ideas to a client. That idea sucks. I'm going to go with this idea over here. Hey, this one's shiny. We're going to do this one. Well, now you've just said you can't complete an idea that you came up with, that you already sold me on. You can't bring that to life. So I'm having doubts in you already. The other thing you told me is you're quick to quit on yourself. When things suck and get hard, you're going to quit. And then here, let me tell you the fun fact about the wall and how much that wall sucks. Idea B, great, you go over here, sweet. Shit, there's a wall here too. There's a wall here. The wall is like a big U shape. That if you want to progress forward in any way, you're gonna to have to get through it. I hit that wall today and it sucked. Oh man, it sucked. All right, my girlfriend's here too. And I gotta admit this right now in front of her. That was like, um, I'm gonna lose my favorite client because I can't figure out how to make this stuff work. Okay, I got bills to pay. I care about being good at what I do. So I just kept pushing through it. And at the end of it, I came out with something that I was even impressed with, impressed with. And I showed it to the client, they loved it. They're like, hell yeah, that looks great. Keep going. Great. What got me through that wall? Deadlines will get you through that wall. Just continue going. Just keep going. It sucks, yes. But you don't get to the finish line of anything feeling that great. You feel accomplished. That's the good feeling. That's the feeling that will keep you going on. Not the feeling of that wall or how bad things get. Who are athletes here? Who's ever ran a half marathon, a 5K, anything? Who's done an endurance event? I'm an endurance athlete, so I can relate to this really easily. Who feels good halfway through one of those things? <laughs> Who works out? And I, I love it. It makes me feel great. But every workout I ever do, three minutes into it, I'm like, this is stupid. I'm done. <laughs> I don't even want to do this anymore. I don't quit, but I want to. The thoughts are there. You never get to the finish line of anything with it being easy. You're going to go through some shit. So you might as well just push through that wall. All right? So, Steve, how do I get through that wall? <laughs> Great, you told me it exists. My students will tell me all the time. I'll get emails, I'll get Slack group cha chats, Facebook hits. Yeah, got that wall. Yep. Yeah, you did. But how do you get through it? Ask questions. The one thing I can state to all of you is us in this industry, most of us, not all of us, love answering questions. Because we love it. We love animating. We love designing. We love the personality and bringing this stuff to life. So if, what's your name? Yep. Uh, Trevor. Trevor? If Trevor hits me up today, says, Steve, yeah, I fell asleep a little bit while you were talking, but there was one thing you said and I forgot it. I'm going to answer Trevor's question because I like talking. All right? If somebody hits me up and says, hey, Steve, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Will you look at my work? Absolutely, I'd look at your work. Why? Because you care enough to ask the question. You want to grow. As students, you should all have a ton of questions. If you don't have questions, you're not taking this seriously. Simple as that. All right? I have questions at my stage. So if you don't have questions, then maybe animation, maybe design, maybe web isn't the, world, uh, the route for you. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. Don't let that discourage you. You're a student. It's supposed to be fun. You all have the best luxury in the world, and I wish I had it still, is you have the ability to mess up. You have the ability to make mistakes, and guess what? Cool. You learn from them. Just keep moving on. Just keep moving forward with that stuff. It doesn't hold you back. It doesn't cost you anything, because you still learn something. You didn't do it with a client. I make a mistake. I miss a deadline, we could lose a client. That could be a $40,000 job. That could be a $750,000 job. We just lost a $750,000 job because of me making a mistake. How do y'all think that's going to go over? <laughs> Not well, okay? How do you think the receptionist is going to feel when she gets let go? Or the client service people, the people who aren't bringing the income in. How do you think they're going to feel because I messed up? I'm letting all those people down. It's not just about you. Choose your own adventure, all right? Embrace the fact that it's more than just you doing this, and it's a good thing. Ask questions. What questions do I ask? Put how real small, cross it all out, and put why large. For one main reason. Again, we talked technical. Technical knowledge does not separate. 
the understanding of how to do things does not separate you. The knowing of why is what separates you. I can do a whole bunch of stuff. I can animate everything. I, Steve, how'd you make that cool little cube guy? How'd you make that band piece bust out? All right, how'd you get started with uh, Odd Fellows working with this stuff? Yeah, I can answer all that, but that doesn't help you any. Yeah, you may learn how to replicate what I've done, but that doesn't give you value. But if you know why I did something, why did you pick that color combination? Why did you pick that font family? Why did you do that with the uh, contrast and sizes? Well, it's like the saying, if you teach somebody how to fish, they'll always be, or they'll never be hungry, but if you give them a fish, they'll starve afterwards. All right? There's a bigger picture to it all. And when you understand the how, or the whys, and not the hows, that's when you can grow, okay? And that's as simple as even saying, Steve, why does contrast matter? Great, we already talked about that. I'll, I'll reiterate why. But if you know that, you can grow. My favorite. Well, no, no, my, not my favorite. My favorite's one of the last ones, and if you know me, it's hilarious. Um, embracing what you are bad at. Yes, I love this side. Okay. Here's the thing. When I first started in this industry, I got pretty decent at animation. I was bad at design. Because I never put the work into it. I was like, I'm going to be a VFX artist. I'm not going to be, I don't need to design. And then guess what I had to do? Design. I had to design a lot, and I was bad at it, and it sucked. And I always tried to avoid it, but I was never able to. So finally, I was like, you know what? I have to get good at design. I do. I just have to keep practicing. I just have to keep doing small stuff. You have to embrace what you're bad at. Because what you're good at, great. People are going to see your demo reel, and if you're good at animation, love it. People are going to see your portfolio if you're a designer. And they see that you understand colors. Great. That's wonderful. But do you understand scale and proportion? Does your stuff fit together? No, because you didn't embrace that stuff, the stuff that confused you? All right, sorry. Maybe you just hit, hurt yourself. Why? Because you avoided what you're bad at. How many of you could get up here right now and talk in front of all these people? There's no bad answer to this, by the way. So a few. Great. Every one of you now knows something you need to work on that did not raise your hand. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. Be comfortable talking. Because this industry is not about showing work. It's about selling work. It's about making people feel excited about a project that you're working on. And if you don't do that, if you don't get that transfer of emotion, you're not going to sell your project. Simple as that. If you're an introvert, it's okay. Most people today all right, are becoming introverted because of cell phones, text messaging, emailing. It's easier to hide behind a screen and let things progress. Hey, here's an email. Oh, uh, you calling me? Uh, uh, oh, it says, uh, what you need? You were staring at your damn phone. Answer it. All right, you have a question. Call somebody and ask. You want to speak up. You have questions you want to ask me. Speak up and say it. If you're thinking them, you're only losing out. All right. If you're an introvert, be the first person to introduce yourself when you walk into a room. That's a rule that I try to hold myself accountable as much as possible. I walk into any room, and I'm the first person to walk up to everybody and shake their hand. Hey, I'm Steve. I'm not going to remember most of these people's names. But they'll remember that I at least look at them high enough to introduce myself, to acknowledge them, rather than just kind of sit there and wait for things to happen. You can sit there and wait for things to happen. I hope you do. But I don't hope you do. Right, I hope CCS students do. Um, because you're actually making life easier for me. You're less competition at that point. Put yourself out there. Embrace what you're bad at. And you're going to see yourself become more comfortable in doing all of this. Moving on. Talent is expected. This, I'm going to scream as loud as I possibly can. Joey Corman, I think I said his last name right, of School of Motion, said it perfectly when he said, talent is the price of admission. To get into this industry, you're expected to be talented to some level. All right? You're not expected to be the greatest or anything like that, but talent is expected before you even start a project. I expect that you know how to sketch. I expect that you know how to design a little bit. I don't know if you do that, but it's fine. Um, I expect that you're going to be able to carry this. I don't expect that you're going to be able to do it flawlessly, especially if you're an intern, if you're student level. I'm there to help you to make sure that we get to that finish line. But you're expected to be talented. What is not expected, and it's a shame, is how you act as a person. All right? 
How you act as a person in this industry is going to go so much further, so much further than your talent level. Okay? Client changes are going to come in. You're going to do something, they're going to change it. And they're going to change it again, and they're going to change it again, and again, and again, and again. See how this is going. The one thing you can control, the one and only thing you can control, is your emotions when that happens. It's how you act. Okay? A producer is going to come to you because that's how it works, the chain of command. The client will communicate with the producer, the producer will tell you what the client wants. You will turn, get angry, or whatever you get, and you're going to take it out on your producer. You're going to say, oh, I can't do this in this time, blah, blah, blah. The producer doesn't care. All right? When you get in this industry, who's in this industry right now? By a show of hands. Okay, great. When you're talking to your producer, your art director, your creative director, anything, before you even have any of those outbursts, stop. They don't care. They don't. But if you can say, all right, cool, great, not a problem. Or, hey, what's the timeline again? Uh, all right, I'm going to do my best. I know I can get this part done for sure. It's going to go much better for you. Posing problems isn't helping. Posing solutions to problems that are brought to you, that's what's helping. So talent is expected. How you act, though, that's what's going to keep getting you hired. I work with a bunch of people all right, over my course of my career. A lot of them were talented, but that doesn't mean they all had the attitudes. All right, Steve, you told me talent's expected. Do I even focus on that? All right, how do I get to this point? Embrace what you're bad at. Certain things that we've talked about. You know what you need to improve on. And if you don't, we go back to the ask questions. Hit me up, all right? I, the internet is open for everybody. There's a guy in this industry, Ryan Summers who has literally opened his lunch schedule to anybody willing to email him. Or hit him up and he'll do Skype calls with you. He'll critique your work, he'll critique your demo reel, he'll just talk to you about the industry because he loves talking about it. Crazy awesome talent, worked on Pacific Rim, the opening titles, okay? So a guy like that has an open door for you. So ask the questions. One thing that I learned, and this is a concept that carries over across the board. This isn't about animation or design, and it can be, and we'll look at it in that way, but it's about everything. I learned this from one of the smartest people I know, and he taught me, you have three buckets, okay? Your bucket A, your bucket B, and your bucket C. Every project, and I'm going to talk about animation for a second, you can't do everything. You can't focus 100% on everything, okay? If you're trying to, you're not. 100% of your day, goes to animation, well, where did time to eat, sleep, be a human, work, work on design, all that go. That got ignored. So you can't put 100% into everything. You got to divvy it up. Bucket A is a small bucket. You can't put much in it. Just your core foundation. So if I get an animation, if I get a storyboards, uh, design frame, Steve, you got to bring this to life. The first thing that goes through my mind is all that fun stuff that we love animating. All those little doodad smears frames, everything like that. Those cool morphing transitions. But the most important thing is, what can I get done? What needs to be done? What, if I don't do it, is going to make this project tank? That goes in bucket A. Use that with your personal life. What do you give time to in your personal life that you can't go without? Bucket B is a little bit bigger. You can get a little bit more into that. Bucket B might be some of the fun stuff that you enjoy a little bit more. Things that aren't crucial, if bucket B isn't done, yeah, you may not like it as much, but you can still keep moving on. So in animation, bucket B, maybe I'm trying a little bit more stuff, okay? But I'm only getting to bucket B when I've finished bucket A. Then you got bucket C. Bucket C, you can put everything in. It's as big as the universe. You can do whatever you want. If you jump to bucket C and you've forgotten all this other stuff, you're going to fail your project, okay? If you've forgotten all the design principles, all the animation basics that need to happen, I don't care how many smears or motion trails you have. I'm so sick and tired of seeing motion trails. Um, it doesn't matter. You're hiding behind that stuff. You're putting that lipstick on a pig. So spend that time on bucket A. Learn how to divvy up your time. And I can't tell you how to do that. That's up to you. But you can use that principle in any facet of your life. This is one of my favorites. And as bluntly as I can say it, don't be a dick. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. Who in this room got in this industry because they hate art? Nobody. Who got in this industry because they hate people? But you may not like people. You may be introverted. Maybe I saw somebody. That was great. That's fine. 
But great. You get into this because it's fun. Who wants to work on movies, film, television? Absolutely. Who wants to do something that they can look out there and be like, hey, check this out. Look what I did. <laughs> Deep down, we all have an ego. We may store it down. I kill my ego every day. I try to. But I still have it. I still want to put my stuff out there. But what I mean by don't be a dick is when a producer comes up to you, like I said, it's up to you to control how you react. When you're working with other artists, there could be a day where one of you is my boss. The irony in this whole thing. David was one of my students here when I taught him the poem. There was a time where David just recently hit me up and said, hey, Steve, um, you available for freelance? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, cool. Let's do some stuff together. I don't think I was. Things didn't work out. But if I treated David awful, way, way back when, David, how long ago was that? Years. I was in yeah. If I was a jerk to him, I would have missed out on an opportunity right then and there. Why would he want to work with me? Look at the people around you. There's people in this room, and I don't, please don't respond to this. There's people in this room you would love to work with. There's people in this room you're like, I will be happy when I never see that person again. All right? It's just the way us as humans are built, and that's fine. Keep those emotions down. Keep those emotions for when you talk to one of your friends, okay? Don't let that out. Don't let people know those are how you're feeling, okay? Don't be a dick. One of the most talented people I worked with getting into this industry treated me like absolute shit. Absolute shit. I've had opportunities where I could have brought him on and people would ask me, hey, what do you think of this guy? He's talented, but it stops there. You're not going to want to hire him for a project because he doesn't take deadlines seriously and he doesn't work well with other people. That dude just missed out. Could have been a great gig. All right. There's another time where somebody, I'm not going to say names, hit me up as well and said, hey, we're looking to hire this guy. What do you think of him? Well, I had only seen him in passing at a company that I worked with, but he was real nice to me. His talent, he's got a ways to go, but his personality, he was cool. And I felt like he needed a fresh start. So I was able to say, hey, this guy, and no reason to be cool to me, but he was a nice guy. I was able to pass along a good recommendation to this person just because that was my interaction. You never know what opportunities could potentially hit your way, but if you're a jerk about it, you're going to miss them right in the beginning. Cannot take everything too seriously. Art is subjective. Everything you do is subjective. Okay? And this is the greatest and worst thing. It's the worst because, oh man, it makes you want to snap it sometimes. And then on the opposite side, if we all created the exact same thing, there'd be no value. Everything would look the same. That's boring as hell. All right? So remember, when you create something, your taste doesn't necessarily need to be the same as my taste. I hate Picasso. I said it. I love Da Vinci. Da Vinci, in my opinion, he took time. He's like, I'm going to actually study how the body's broken up. I'm going to study proportions. Picasso's like, shit, I'm drunk. I'm just going to do this and this and this. Faces are everywhere. All right. Some of you highly disagree with me. I may now have just been knocked down in your eyes. That's fine. Art's subjective. I say all of that only for the point of what I like doesn't mean it's what you like. What you like doesn't mean it's what they like. What is important is what we create is what the client likes. When you're getting paid to create artwork, you have to take into consideration what your client likes. I just did a pitch for a company that I actually didn't want to work with. Um, and I came up with a concept for them. And I still wholeheartedly believe it was the best concept they would have ever came up with. And I pitched it to them, and I even told them that. I was like, you are not getting better than this. I have checked off every box. This is great. This is high end. Guess what he wanted? At the end of it, he ended up not going with my pitch and design because he wants one of those cheap little $1,000 videos that he can get where the characters move all noodly and everything's all weird and it sinks all off. You've all seen the cheap videos. That's what they want. It's so weird, but it's subjective. That's what he felt fit his brand. I can't convince somebody that way. Cool. Awesome. Great. We're going to create this noodly video for you, and it's going to be the best noodly video you've ever seen. You have to change your perspective, but art is subjective. Raise your hand if I can go online right now and find your stuff. Great. I actually like seeing that because a lot of people get nervous in the beginning. I want to be honest with you. I don't know any of your work. I don't know what it looks like because I don't know how to find you yet. I'm not looking for you. In the beginning when you're a student, you freeze up. And that goes both ways too, by the way. You may not have ever seen my work or heard my name before today. And then all of a sudden you hear my name and you're like, huh, who's this guy that looks like Groot but apparently isn't Groot? 
All right. Nobody's looking for you yet, so put your stuff out there. You have 0% chance of getting anywhere if you don't exist in the world of the internet with design and animation and web coding, app development. 0%. If you at least put your stuff out there, giving yourself a chance. If I say, hey, great, we're chatting after this, and you're like, oh, I'd love for you to see my work. I'm like, great, send me a link. Oh, I don't have it online. Shit, you just missed an opportunity. I don't care how good your work is. I don't care if you're just starting out or if you're better than I am. It's all the same playing field for me. You're going to get an honest reaction. If you're willing to ask me the question look at your work, I'm willing to give you as much help as I possibly can. Choose your own adventure is what it comes down to. Also keep in mind, everything you see online is only what us artists want you to see. And the same for you. What you post online of your work is only what you want people to see, what you're most proud of. Okay? What gets the most Instagram likes? What got me the biggest dribble following or Twitter following? Everybody loves this, retweet, great, ah, ah, ah. It's awesome. What happens though is when you're still new and you're learning, and you're learning how to create work, you end up getting paralyzed by that. How many of you have seen work and been like, ah, oh, shit, I'm not even inspired to create anything anymore? Because you get overwhelmed, you're like, I can't do that, and it goes back to the gap that we talked about. There's this, I want, I want everything broken. You get paralyzed. <laughs> Keep in mind, you only see the success stories. Nobody sees, y'all saw my demo reel. You know what you didn't see on that? The Lazy Boy commercials I had to make years and years ago. <laughs> you didn't see the casino spots I've had to do. I just worked with this company. I don't know who knows of them. They're an awesome company. Look them up if you are. We are doing some awesome work. It's so, so much fun. But in between that work, we actually had some stuff where they showed me and I was like, um, all right, so we got to talk real quick because this is really bad. Like, you guys are showing, and they're like, we know. Cool, as long as you know. Because what I'm about to turn out for you is not impressive. It's not something you'd ever post. Companies like that have to do that work. Companies like Buck have to do that work. What you see is the highlight reel. What you don't see is what pays the bills. I'm going to repeat that. What you see is the highlight reel. What you don't see is what pays the bills. All right? A lot of companies will take on and do stuff at a lower budget just because of the exposure. I want to move into valuing yourself. This is something that I can get really, really heated on. Okay? And I'm not going to right now. Well, I probably will. Um, who's been asked to create work for free? Who's been asked to create work for the promise of there's going to be more work? There's no budget yet, but the next one. Oh, we got you for the next one. I want you to do this for me. If you really, really believe in this philosophy and buy into this story, I'm going to tell you one thing first, and I'm going to tell you an analogy. I have never once gotten more work from somebody who promised me more work who wanted me to work for free. I have never once got a better opportunity from any of that. Why? Because they don't value you. If you're not willing to pay for something, you don't value it. And if you don't value it, yeah, it's cool. It's not cool. It is what it is. Go to... A dentist, a surgeon. Yeah, let's go to a surgeon. And say, hey, tore everything. It's real bad. I can't walk. But I know a lot of people. I have a huge social media follower. I've got millions of followers. You fix me for free, and I'm walking and feeling good, I swear I will tell everybody. And they will come to you, and you'll make a ton of money. Who's getting surgery from that person? Nobody. Because nobody's ever going to sign off to that. OK? It's not how it works. If people don't value enough for your time and to pay for it, they're not going to value the work that you create. The scariest thing that you can hear is, there's no deadline, but it's cool. Uh, you know, you got artistic uh, freedom or whatever. What that means is you as a client don't have any idea what the hell you want, and I'm just going to keep doing stuff with no end in sight. And that is a scary thing. All right? And for example, use even this meeting. We'll full circle everything. Who paid to come in here? Nobody. You paid for your time. Your time is valuable. <laughs> your time is valuable. But you didn't pay for anything. Now, if we charged you $50 at the door, how many of you would be making sure you're taking notes? You'd be taking pictures. You'd be asking all kinds of questions. You'd be, where's my free food? I want coffee. Like, <laughs> I need stuff if I'm paying. Because you expect it. But when you don't, well, I mean, if you guys don't like what I have to say, well, I didn't really charge you, so I don't know. It is what it is. Value yourself, though, is what I'm trying to say. Value the work that you create, because what you create is special. What you create is a skill. It's a talent that you're working on and you're honing and you're crafting. 
If they could do it, they would do it. They wouldn't pay or ask you to do it for them. All right, I can only begin to ask you not to work for free. You're gonna do it if you want to, but it's not gonna work out for you no matter what empty promises you get. Yes? So let's say uh, I had a coworker who came up to me and asked me if I could paint a picture of his cat for them. And they asked me how much to pay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how much. So think of it this way. Um, I love doing illustrations. The question was, hey, I'm going to ask you to do a painting of this cat, which was awesome. Um, how much do I charge for that? Well, what is your time worth to you? How long is it going to take you to paint that cat? My illustrations, if you've seen the group, or if you know any of my illustrations, are photorealistic. They take a lot of time. I'll put 40 hours plus into that. I can't charge somebody 40 hours plus worth of work. Think about what you could comfortably bring in financially for one week worth of work. That's how much you should charge for 40 hours of work of illustration. People aren't necessarily willing to pay for that though. Oh, I was thinking like $50, $75. $50, $75, $50, Sorry, it's not happening. So there's a, a baseline where you have to start saying, hey, what's my time worth? I have a day rate for animating for freelance, okay? You pay for me by the day. You don't pay for me by the hour, why? Because if you pay for me by the hour, you've stopped me from taking on any more work that day. You booked me Monday through Friday. Wednesday, you tell me, hey, we don't have anything for you. We're waiting on client changes. Um, we'd appreciate it if you don't bill us. Sorry, I'm billing you, all right? I can't go find work, but if I turned you down, I could have found work elsewhere. You gotta value yourself and value your time. So I can't give you an honest assessment of how much you should charge, but I would say, what is one day worth of your life worth? That's how much you should charge. Question. Yes. So money and time is how you value yourself. It, you can't go beyond, there is anything beyond that. You can value yourself differently. Other people who pay you to create artwork will only value based upon your cost. If I cut my day rate in half, so let's say I charge, I'm gonna make up a number because it doesn't matter. Let's say I charge $1,000 a day for an agency. They're gonna make decisions a lot quicker than if I'm charging $300 I'm charging 300, great. We can get an extra three days out of work and we don't have to do anything out of this guy. We can drag him through. So they're not gonna value me as much. So that's how you show value, that you're valuable to people? That is how I do. Okay. Yes. Um, and your work will also speak volumes. But again, talent is expected. Your personality will go further. People won't mind paying you when you get to a higher level. And by higher level, you're just doing it professionally for a client, All right, not for a friend. We'll talk more about the money, because I love talking about the money thing. Here's one other thing for you. Not everything needs to be good. Everything that you create doesn't need to be the best thing. It doesn't always need to be better than the thing you did before. If you get so focused on that, you're going to stop creating. Happened to me. I can say that once I started teaching for MoGraph Mentor personally, all of a sudden, I was on a pedestal that I didn't want to be on. And I didn't feel like I deserved to be on that pedestal. And I felt like everything that I created from that point had to be the best of the best. And it actually stopped me from creating. But then when you just say, hey, sometimes maybe I just learned something, especially at the student level. Y'all don't need to create a whole bunch of stuff. Y'all just need to create a couple short things. Because then you learn a technique. You try some stuff. You break some stuff. You feel more comfortable with the program. You're understanding the hows. All right? You're understanding the whys. You're learning a little bit of everything. So there's always something to gain. I just did this cool little, in my opinion, cool little uh, orbit circle thing. It took me a couple hours, it wasn't anything major, but it was fun to do. David, for example, posts shit on his Instagram all the time of just quick little animations that he does, and I love it. Why? Because he's doing stuff, I'm able to still see he's relevant, and the stuff he creates is pretty cool. Sometimes it's just the bounces. He just did something on his new computer. Bounces, stretches. Big thing here that we are noticing is I'm talking about his work because he put it out there. Put your work out there. All right? Value yourself. And no, not everything needs to be good. It just needs to be getting better. It needs to be trying. You need to be in a better spot than you were the day before. This is a slide that I never thought I would have to have. Oh, all right. And I've learned in teaching that I absolutely need to have this slide. Don't use stock, please, on animations or vector designs or any of that kind of stuff. I don't want to see it, okay? I hate it. Don't use stock templates, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you the gray area. I'm going to tell you the asterisks first, and then we're going to talk about this real quick. 
If you're an animator, you're not a web designer. So if you use a stock web template to build your website, okay, that's fine. Because you're not selling yourself as a web designer. All right, vice versa. If you're a web designer and you want this little animation, all right, cool, whatever. But if you're trying to get hired to create work and content, then I need to know that you care and actually want to create that work and content. I've actually seen people put in projects stock vector work, and you may have done it too. I'm here to tell you, don't ever do it again. Take it out. Because if you do not care enough to create the work now that you're putting into your portfolio, that you're putting into your client, what are you doing? Like the whole point of this is to have fun. You're, you've eliminated that whole thing just so you get to the finish line. Well, the floor when you travel it isn't a good one, and the work you're showing now isn't a good one. So if you aren't willing to put in those hours, if you aren't willing to grind all that time, I don't know what you're doing in this industry. It's not for you. Um, all right. This is my favorite slide ever. <laughs> and if you know me, yeah, it's true. Um, so first off, as people, we are emotional to an extent. Stop it. In this industry, there's no room for emotions. There's no room for feelings. They don't exist. You can get your client to feel something with your animations, but you, you can't be married to anything you create. Why? Art's subjective. Okay? So, let me give you an example. You're going to put together a pitch. Okay? Clients can come to you and say, hey, we need a couple concepts. Come up with what you want. And you're like, sweet. I got idea A, B, and C. C sucks. I hate C, but I had to put together a third idea. But idea A, that's the one that I want them to go with. But you know what? I'm going to play some psychology. I'm going to switch around and show them idea B, A, then C. That way they get so excited about idea B, they're going to ignore everything. Clients can pick idea C every time. It never fails. <laughs> They'll always pick the worst one. It just happens. Clients going to look at your animation and be like, ah, we need to make that red. <laughs> red is the worst color that we could possibly make. Um, no, you can't say that. You say, hey, great, I got it. Like Red, absolutely, good idea. But this color is going to go a lot better. It's going to be a lot more visually appealing. Red's going to evict rage and hate, and we're trying to create something peaceful, so let's go on the cooler palettes. Nah, I get it, but let's go red. Great, red, I, that's the color I actually wanted to go with. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> yes. You gotta sell it, all right? Get rid of those emotions. I've created projects that I've loved. And guess what? It's X'd. I just did this thing for Google. My favorite part of it. And I knew it, oh, and I knew it because it was my favorite part. I was like, it's this, and it was just this little thing. I was like, they aren't even gonna, yeah, can you take that out? Shit. <laughs> it happens. Keep it for your own self. Keep it for your own version. All right? You can't have emotions. I have one rule. I have a lot of rules. I'm a liar. Um, one thing that I live by, and if you ever work with me, you'll notice this, and you'll be like, he's doing it. Anytime anybody hits me up on a change, if I get a Slack notification, if I get an email, a client says something, producer says something, producer in face says something, all right, cool, I'll take care of it, I'll get back to you. In my head, I may be panicking. I may see something right now on my phone or might get a notification that says, oh, everything's on fire. I wait 15 minutes no matter what to respond. 15 minutes minimum. Why? Because then I've taken, made sure that I'm not giving an emotional response. Because I've gotten a list of changes where I'm like, Shh, this is going to take forever. I, I might as well just restart this whole thing. And that's my attitude, but they can't see it because I'm through the monitor. 15 minutes later, though, I feel better. I've come up with an approach. I thought, all right, cool, this is how I'm going to tackle that. To move forward with that point. My response to them is, all right, great, cool, sounds good. She's seen me, he's seen me. I'll get changes, and I'm like, she's, what the? <laughs> Don't let them see that, all right? It goes to not being a dick. It goes to choosing your own adventure. Everything goes full circle. That's how I want to wrap this up. I'm gonna open this for questions, and I'm gonna close after that. But it truly comes down to you're going to do one of two things. That's it. It's up to you what you're going to do. Some of you are going to go home, and you're going to work hard tonight. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to try some of these concepts. Some of you are going to go home, and you're honestly tired. I'm just going to go to bed. I'm going to drink a beer. I'm going to do whatever I want. Cool. That's what you're going to do. Remember, every moment you're not putting into getting better or embracing being bad at something or not being a dick or not asking questions, somebody else is. Somebody else is trying to get better. Somebody else is putting themselves out there. Somebody else is trying to make those connections. I'm one of them. I'm always trying to do that. All right? So every second you're not doing it, 
Somebody else is. And if you truly want to be there, if you truly want that finish line of saying, Shit, I want to be up there. I want to be talking. Or, you know, I don't really want to talk, but I just want to be working with those type of people. I want that type of knowledge. I want those type of skill sets. That's how you get there. You got to grind. There's no easy route. Nobody just handed me shit. All right? Nobody just said, hey, you can be great now. Or, hey, uh, here's money. I had to ask for it. I had to go out and get it. When I was at Macomb Community College, and that's why being here with all of you, to me, right now is so special and nostalgic. All I cared about was being right here. And now that I'm right here, it's like the gap. I'm like, shit, where do I go from now? Like, well, what's the next thing? But all I gave about was that I didn't want to bartend anymore. I love bartending, don't get me wrong. Up with my social skills, you know, I had some good drinks. All right. I love being a server. No, I hated being a server, that part sucked. But the money was good. But I was working full time, nonstop. I was going to Macomb full time. On top of it, I was helping Brian Sorio as a lab tech. Sean was lending me books that I think I still have. Sorry, Sean. <laughs> um, I was trying to be a part of this. I still see on Facebook now. How many see the, on this day? It's really cool, I think. 2007, 2000, or 2008, I see 1230 in the morning. I'm posting some stupid because I'm 20 years old, saying, drink coffee on After Effects, learning color correction, doing some tutorials. People lived with me, I had a roommate. He was over there, actually. And he'd get home, I'd be up working. That's just how it went, because I was willing to put in that work. Choose your own adventure. I cannot do this for you. Nobody around you can do this for you. Do not look at outside reasons of why you aren't where you are. Do not make excuses. You're a student. You're not supposed to be great yet. You're supposed to enjoy this. If you didn't go through this time, when you get to the point where you have those successes, it won't mean as much. All right, so choose your own adventure. I want to open up the questions before I close out. Yes. So right now, I'm going for a uh, design and layout yep. degree, and that's what I'm learning about. Yes. However, I do have very good illustration skills, yep. but I'm not going for a degree. I don't know if that's, like, I don't know if it's like going for a second degree in illustration is going to affect. So I love that question. Well, like, I'm so sorry, glad you got this. No, no, it's a great question because I'm going to sum it up. And if I'm wrong, please, Second. please correct me. She's going for a degree in one facet, and is thinking, "Hey, I'm really good at another side of this. Should I also get a degree in that?" Okay, I have to tell you one thing: the time, the experience that you're going to get into those classes or out of those classes are amazing. That's where you're going to progress. That's where you're going to learn. The degree aspect of it, though, I've been asked for my degree one time. Anybody want to take a guess when I got asked for my degree? Nobody's going to get it. Nope. Teaching? Nope. Bartending? No. Nope. Oh, that would have been a good one. <laughs> when I bought a house. Oh, that is the only time I've ever been asked, hey, can, I, can we see your degree? Because they were like, hey, about two years ago, you were real poor. And I was like, yeah, I was. <laughs> what do you expect? I was, I was in school. I was bartending. They're like, oh, well, if you were, do you have a copy of your degree? Yeah, all right, I got a house, that was it. So <laughs> the degree got me a house. <laughs> but again, it's a double-edged sword question. The time that you get into learning these skills are second to none. There's no way to fast track that. So the education is great, but the degree itself, yeah. If you're not really into social media that much, how yep. do you promote yourself because sure. of that? Oh, you have to have a website at least, a Vimeo. Uh, what are you I going for? Like, Design layout, you want to have a website. You want to have an easy way for people to see your work. So whether it be a Behance website, Adobe, if you're an Adobe subscriber, so you can get free websites. No, you don't. There's actually some of the most talented people I've worked with uh, don't have those things. And honestly, it's really hard to get a follow. People get obsessed. And if you don't get those likes, you don't get that gratification. So yeah, I'm speaking as a hypocrite. I put the work into making sure that because it helps me financially. I am more relevant. I post illustrations all the time. And I don't get paid for illustrations because I don't take on illustration works because nobody wants value. But it keeps me relevant. My other question is how to be more relevant. Ah, just keep <laughs> posting stuff. Keep putting yourself out there. I will say, I'm not gonna say who it was. Somebody in this room, okay, that I had never met, hit me up and said, hey, would you want to meet for coffee? Sure, I don't care, I like coffee. Mm -hmm. Sat down, we talked for what, an hour maybe? Just BS. 
that person, I now know that person. When they walked in today, I was like, hey, what's up? I'm purposely not looking at them, so <laughs> you aren't going to figure it out unless they've told you. Hold on, I have a question over here. You just said that you make websites that you play for Adobe? Uh, yes, so Adobe has a thing where you can load your content on. They have some type of Adobe stock, uh, it's not stock. Um, portfolio. Portfolio, thank you. Um, I don't use it because I have a website, so I'm not, it just gets to a point where you're like, Jesus Christ, how much stuff am I going to manage? You pay to but, have that website. Yes, all websites, I think there is a version, um, you guys may know better than me, that's a free website that'll host your stuff, and that's completely great as a student level. If you're a student or applying for an internship or a junior position, and you give me a free website hosting where you're locked in, I am mad at you. I'm happy that you put your work out there. That's wonderful. Thank you. So if I'm a web designer student, can I, is there a way I can design my own? If you're a web design student, then you absolutely want to make sure that you try to tailor that you control or done all the back end stuff to your website. Because a lot of things that web designers, people who hire web designers, local agencies especially, they want to see your wireframes. And the wireframes are the worst thing to show anybody because you're like, they're just a bunch of boxes. Sorry. So, yeah, but try to get your stuff out there. In one second. Yes. Hi. Um, thank Hi. you so much for the presentation. Oh, thanks for coming. Um, okay. Um, quick question for you. Um, you went to a home. Did you decide to go anywhere else after my problem is that I want to become a Disney Imagineer. I'm trying to get myself forward to there. A lot of people say that uh, big schools for name recognition are a big thing to go on. Like, I was considering the SCAD. Um, mm -hmm. so Choices for me. I saw that you worked for Disney a little bit. Previous. Yes. Did you hop right into freelance and just kind of go for it, or did you decide to go somewhere else um, first? Okay, so that's awesome. All right, I'm going to try to tackle this in two parts because there was the hop into freelance part and there was the schooling part. It's a six step, and I actually had it originally to show you guys, and I ended up deleting it because, as you can see, I had a lot of slides that I wanted to get through. Art school is the most expensive school to go to right now. The art education is hands down, people are gouging prices. It's insane how expensive it is because it's a business. So it comes back to one important thing. You cannot trade dollars and hours for a job. It's not gonna happen. So where you went to school, you may learn some great lessons, but financially did it make the most sense? Now there's a school full sale. Maybe it's a great school. I know a company local, RTT, pretty excited. Um, they pull a lot of students from there but they end up just doing chop turnaround work. To go to full sale, you're gonna spend $85,000 for three years. And then you gotta pay that back plus interest. $85,000 to be an artist. And you're not promised a job afterwards. So it's a great question. I personally try to recommend to people to hone their skills at the most financially affordable thing for them and then branch out. Because just going to, I went to CCS for a month and had to pay $10,000 for that month. 